This is Star Talk Sports Edition. This one titled, Taking a Hit. More on that in a couple of minutes. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. Let me introduce my co-host, Chuck Nice. Chuck. Hey, Neil. What's happening? All right. Go, hanging in there, Chuck, my professional comedian co-host mm -hmm. who loves sports, though never did it professionally. Well, thanks for pointing that part out. <laughs> okay. Just... <laughs> For the professional side of sports, we've got Gary O'Reilly, former soccer pro, current sports commentator, and we are lucky and privileged to have him for Star Talk Sports Edition. Gary, how you feeling, oh, man? I'm good, my friend, and the privilege is mine, and thank you. Now, you're always cooking up shows with clever titles, and, <laughs> and, and you're, you're digging yeah. people out of places that I didn't even know they were hiding. And mm -hmm. so, what do you have in store for us today? Um, all right. We are going to meet someone who is not just a cannabis user. But Ken, we're back had, on marijuana. You can't let the, the subject go. Can't, apparently not. But okay. <laughs> someone who has now gone into the CBD business. Okay. And who happens to have been a world-class athlete with a unique and fascinating story, which we are going to share with our audience today. Uh, then we're going to open it up to our regular expert in these matters, the pot doc herself, Dr. Stacy Gruber. Love me right. some Stacy Gruber. Uh, yeah, we don't have we to get are, enough of her. Yeah, we. Yeah, yeah I, we're I, lucky offline, to be able to have Chuck it. was saying we should we should start a whole cannabis spinoff. Star Talk <laughs> Weed Edition. Star Talk the Weed Edition. edition. <laughs> the weed. It'd be Weedly, wouldn't it? So the if we did it, it'd be oh, Weedly. Yeah. Weedly. Um, okay. So the backstory to our guest today, drafted by Major League Baseball, but never swung a bat in anger. He is, however a Heisman Trophy winner. Now, just remember Heisman Trophy, right? Just for a minute, put that to the back of your mind. And he's a former NFL running back, one of the best there was in the business. Um, but he pretty much took up a permanent residence on the NFL's naughty step for a while. Uh, Eric Myron is someone you'll know formally as Ricky Williams. And he's a man who did things his own way. Uh, as a player, he failed multiple drug tests, was fined considerable amounts of money, retired, and then returned to the NFL, where he proved once again just how talented he really was. He is a qualified yoga instructor, a subject of an ESPN 30 for 30 documentary, currently, if I'm not mistaken, a student at Emperor College Santa Monica on a master's program studying traditional oriental medicine and the force behind the Heisman brand, which supplies a range of CBD products. And Heisman. Oh, I see what he did there. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Spelt spelt in two different ways. And I'm it's guessing you've We got out. it. I followed yeah. you there. There you go, so, my friend. Welcome, Eric. Eric Myron. Welcome to Star Talk. <laughs> Thanks for having me. It's great yeah. to be here. What? Yeah. So let, let me ask, when when you were an active player on cannabis, were you thinking of its the, the, the breadth of its medical value to you at the time? Or you just, just wanted to smoke some pot? <laughs> What? Well, I, I think it's, how much it's, thinking went in at the time. I think that? it's 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 somewhere it's somewhere in the middle, you know, because we always frame our experiences based on our understanding, and you know, I hadn't, I wasn't privy to the fact that there were conversations going on that people were talking about the medicinal benefits. My experience and why I kept coming back to it was because I was getting some benefit from it, but the the training was that there was no benefit. So it was, it took me, I had to have the, ex the experience for myself. Well, you mean the prevailing that. wisdom of the day was that there's no benefit, yet you have direct conflicting evidence to that in your own use. Exactly, yes. Wow, that's pretty cool, man. You were ahead of your time. Yeah. You, it, you're, you're, you're an athlete who was way ahead of your time. I wouldn't say I was ahead of my time. It just was more that I valued feeling good more than I valued money. Yeah, that's that's way ahead of your time, bro. <laughs> I'm not sure if you've seen the state of all professional sports nowadays, but yeah, that's way ahead of your time. <laughs> As so, an athlete, yes. yes. Yeah. Eric, yeah. let's let's do the obvious thing here. You were formerly known as Ricky Williams. You are now Eric Myron. And if I don't ask this question right now, check is gonna bounce up and down like a four year old child for the rest of this podcast. So what was your thinking in terms of changing direction there? Well, you know, the, the simple way to put it is is when when a woman gets married and takes on her husband's name, it, you know, it's it's normal. But the reality yeah. is that's the that's just a convention. It, it's it's a tradition. Um, 
And so I thought about the tradition and I said, I don't get it. You know, for me, I never understood like what, why does everyone take the male's name, especially the kid? Cause when, when the kid is born, we always know who the mother is, but we don't always know who the father is. So it just makes sense for the, for the, the feminine line to, to extend. And so I got married and I said, Hey, that makes sense to me. And so I just, I said, how don't I take your name? And the added benefit was be being a famous football player. Most people know Ricky Williams is a football player and it's more of like people's idea of what a football player is supposed to be. And sometimes that felt kind of like cramped for me. Mm. And so I've, I've realized the, the side effect of changing my name is there's just more, more freedom, right? That I get to step outside of, you know, the old identity. So I feel like I outgrew Ricky Williams and, you know, got married, had a kid and said, Hey, this makes sense. You, are, you get high and you're woke. This is, this yeah. is, that's the whole point to me. Yeah. That, that's the whole point. I was going to say, I was not expecting such a, a thought provoking progressive story behind the name change. And, uh, I'm thoroughly disappointed. Uh, I thought, <laughs> thought, thought you were running from the law or something. Damn. <laughs> Uh, it, 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 turns out, it turns out you're just a super conscientious dude and a deep thinker. It's like, uh, okay. If he's running for the law, he ain't very good at it because he's on our show right now. Just with the, <laughs> he's front lit, right? <laughs> you, re you retired in 2004 from the Dolphins, right? Yes. Um, and if I'm wrong, correct me, please. You went off to California to study ancient holistic medicine. Um what was this itch that you were looking to scratch at this point in your journey? Because not many people walk away from the dolphins and retire. Yeah. Career. Honestly, I was looking for a, a job that felt good to me. As like I said earlier, really, I, I've, I've realized, you know, it took me a while, especially as a football player to value feeling good as a football player. I always was in pain, always was in physical pain, emotional pain, worried who was judging me. And it just was, it was, it just wasn't me. And so when I walked away from football, I started traveling around the world and, and it was interesting. I started meeting people who didn't even know what American football was. And so I started to get a different reflection of who I was. And it was, I liked what I, I liked what I saw. And I realized that I was a sensitive person who really enjoyed making other people feel better. So, you know, another part of it was as I like came back down to reality, I realized I've been a football player my whole life. I don't really know how to do anything else. And so I, the, the itch was I need to develop some kind of skill so I can be of use. And then I, I put them together. I like making other people feel better. I need to develop a skill. And so I looked for some training in how to make people feel better. Mm. Uh, it's called stand-up comedy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Only when Thank it you works. Much. Yeah, only when yeah it works. I was going to say, you know, not for me, but for other, <laughs> for other comedians. Otherwise, it's stand-up disaster, right? Were there other botanicals, Eric, that you gravitated towards other than cannabis, or was it just the cannabis that you were using to manage, balance yourself at that time? You know, it was it was what I what I stepped into was really an understanding of a, of a medical system that uses herbs. So, you know, growing up in, in America, like I thought medicine is you just take pills, yeah. you know? And the idea is something that hurts, it doesn't work. And then you do something about it. And this different model was really about understanding who the person is and providing qualities that this is what I learned in Ayurveda, providing qualities that keep that person in balance. Okay. Meaning if someone is, is as really, is really slow metabolism. Okay. Right. There's certain foods that are that they're going to be able to digest and there's certain foods that are going to give them difficulty. And so you use herbs that are lighter. Okay. Or if someone is, is, uh, sweats a lot or, or they, they retain a lot of water. Okay. You use herbs that, that create balance. Um, and so as I started to learn about that at the same time, I was also learning about myself. And so my understanding of botanicals is that certain botanicals, people or objects, right? Foods, things are more attractive to me, you know, at certain times. And a big part of Ayurveda, which really intrigued me was when, when I was traveling around the world, after I retired, someone gave me a book on Ayurveda and I opened the book and the first chapter was about living in accordance with the seasons. Okay. 
Mm-hmm. And and I remember back when I was in preschool. I remember I remember I was three years old sitting in preschool and we were we were learning about the seasons. Okay, this rudimentary information. Okay, and but it, growing becoming a uh, an adult, I forgot all about the seasons. You know, for me it was just football season and off season. Right. That's the but, seasons. <laughs> yeah. so, do you but, know what? I'm with that. I understand that completely. Yeah. yeah. So, but but as I was before I retired, okay, I was really wrestling internally with how can I invest so much of everything I am into this one thing, and then all of a sudden I'm starting to have other interests. It doesn't make sense to me. And someone I was you know, as I was wrestling with this, someone mentioned the idea of seasons to me, and that was the only thing that helped it make sense. Is that is that one season naturally flows into the next. And I was realizing that I was moving out of a season of being a football player into, be, into being something else. And so when I read that, this book about living in accordance with the seasons, it just spoke to me. It really, it really spoke to me. And just this worldview of things are constantly changing. And if we wanna stay healthy or stay in some kind of balance, we have to be able to, to adapt and move with those changes. Okay, you're describing how sensitive you are, how, how much you care about other... All of this does not fit anybody's stereotype of a football player. And like we said in, in your intro, you kind of did it your way, but that was at a cost to you. Mm. Is, is there? Did you figure what kind of sort of financial cost it was for you to be yourself and thereby get suspended, get fined, whatever? Um, did you? Is, was there a calculation you did and, and you'd say to yourself, I value being me more than I value getting paid to do what everybody else wants me to do? Yeah, yeah, because you know, when I when I was getting paid a whole lot, right? It didn't make me happy. If it did, I, I trust me, I I would I would have still been doing it. Right? And 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 it was more that the thing I was doing to get the money was so against who I actually was that that was the that price. And I don't think there's there's any amount of money, any amount of money where I would do something that I know is not me. That's why I stopped being an assassin. Uh, oh, what, Chuck. Chuck. What? <laughs> just, just, just. Yeah, man, it was, I got to tell you, man, I, I grew a conscience and it really, I just couldn't do it anymore. It was tough. Yeah. You know? So you get it. Anyway. <laughs> right. I love that Eric is the only guy that liked that joke. He was no. like, <laughs> it, was, it was like, you know, Neil and Gary are like, who the hell, what who happened did, to who Chuck? Who invited him to the party? <laughs> <Exactly>. Okay. <laughs> oh, man. Eric was like, dude, that was a funny joke. <laughs> oh, well. All right. Anyway. Eric, what's your feeling on the current, and we're in 2022 right now, the current NFL stance on players failing tests? Because they don't get suspended anymore. They just get a dent in the wallet. So how do you feel from your situation here looking back at that? No, I feel satisfaction, you know, mm-hmm. that that there's not going to be anyone that has to go through the experience that I went through anymore. And I, and I like to think that, you know, me, not only me taking a stand, but the, the way I've lived my life as a cannabis user. You know, I think that that's what I fi- find has made the biggest difference in people when they meet me and they have a conversation with me and any kind of ideas they have about what cannabis does to people, it starts to melt, starts to melt away. So I mm-hmm. like to think that something about my story helped move the conversation so that these changes are starting to occur. Last summer and the, the build-up to the Olympics in Tokyo. Shikari Richardson goes through a traumatic experience, smokes a joint, gets bang, banned. And now, bring it forward to today, we have Brittany Griner locked up in a Russian jail for allegedly possessing marijuana vape cartridges. How do you feel about those two incidents right now? So, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say that they are... Uh, connected in what mm-hmm. I'm about to say, but I am trying to say that they are connected. So one right. of the things about the history <laughs> of, of, of cannabis, in, at least in this country, mm-hmm. is it's been a tool used against people of color. Absolutely. Right, and so because of that, there's a, there's a, there's a stigma around it, you know? It's like if you think of an of a African-American using cannabis, you get an image, right? If you think of a Caucasian using cannabis, Right, you get another image, and they're they're different. And part of the the history is is part of the the cracking down against cannabis was one way to oppress you know, uh, minority cultures. But when the the soldiers came back from Vietnam and they brought you know 
uh, uh, love for cannabis back with them, it kind of spread into the college and, and universities. And you started having college kids starting to consume cannabis. And then the laws became kind of weird, right? Because we can't, right? We can't persecute the, the white college kids. They're just experimenting, right? So it, it was complex. And I think to a certain extent, we've, we've outgrown a lot of that, but some of it is, is, still, is still hanging around, you know? Mm -hmm. And so again, I'm not saying it's directly connected, but I think it's interesting that the two people you brought up, okay, mm -hmm. are, are African American. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so, but the, the the I think one of the things though that these situations has brought to the surface is people are having conversations about it, and I'm and I've seen at least with cannabis when people that we don't expect take a public stance about cannabis, things move, start moving much faster because the stigma starts to to fall. And I remember back in 2004, when I was going through everything with the NFL, no one or no one said anything positively. No one put their neck on the line or shared how they actually felt about cannabis because it was still too early. But with Shikari, you saw a lot of people step forward and make a stance. And because of that, we were starting to see a lot of the, the rules change. Well, well I don't yeah. know anyone who runs faster after smoking a joint <laughs> or do anything. Right. <laughs> with with and, enhanced. Right. You know, yeah. it's, a, it's an interesting... Yeah. And what's what another thing that's interesting is, and this is just in general about especially athletes um, using cannabis is more. It's more about punishing them, and it's less about asking them, right? What are you using it for? How is it yeah. affecting oh, you? Man. Yeah. Oh man, yeah. Because yeah. the thing about Shakari is, is she came out and it said she lost her mother, and yeah. cannabis was helping her deal with what was going on. That's a mental health issue, right? You know, and and one of the big, and I'm proud of the NFL for this. The NFL players, uh, players union, they they they. they in the negotiations in the past, you know, using the, the drug testing has kind of been a carrot in the negotiation process, mm. okay, right? And the players wanted the money more, but the, the players have now said, this is, this is non-negotiable. For us, cannabis is a, is a wellness issue. It's, a, it's, not a, it's not a substance abuse issue. Mm. I and think we're seeing that in, in the general society as a whole, where and partly because I don't know if we're going to get to your CBD business, but I think a big uh, component of that is partly because of the, you know, the usage of CBD oil and mm -hmm. CBD products, because people are seeing um, a health benefit that they're deriving from that usage. Uh, but they're also making the association that, oh, wait a minute, this is this is a derivative. This is from, you know, this it's the same thing, but it doesn't have a THC. Right, right. Well, we're going to get closer into that subject in the next segment. And don't forget, in our third segment, we're going back to the pot doc to tie a bow on all this and get a sense of what the medical research on the frontier shows us. So we will be right back with Eric Myra on Star Talk Sports Edition. We're back, Star Talk Sports Edition, with our special guest, Eric Myra, who is a, a former NFL pro, Heisman Trophy winter, winner. Uh, turned sort of uh, new age uh, student. Blippy, I'm gonna call you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna call you a fellow Blippy. Yep, that's a black hippie. Yeah, oh, that's black real. hippie. That's a black that's hippie. Real. He's a he's a fellow Blippy. I tell people all the time that I'm a Blippy. I just don't dress like one, and I don't let my I don't let my uh, my curls go long. But you know, I'm still a Blippy. I'm, I'm gonna yeah, call so, you a fellow. Because I knew about fellow blurs, blippy. black nerds. I didn't I'm know also we had a blur. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a blurred and a blippy. Guilty. So, Eric, you went into business, and you, you've got the brand Heisman, H-I-G-H-S-M-A-N, Heisman. Uh, really brilliant name there. We see what you did there. And this is to market products of different derivatives from the marijuana plant. And so what, what led you to go into business doing this? I guess to a certain extent, it, it is it is marketing the the derivatives, the um, the secondary metabolites of the cannabis uh, sativa plant, but but really it's you know I created this more to accentuate my platform. So, just to clarify one thing, in 2018 I launched a CBD company called Real Wellness, and I was uh, combining cannabinoids with traditional uh, herbal formulas, creating medicine. That company is still going. Uh, last year, last September, I launched Heisman, which is in the THC space. Okay. And it's specifically to talk about- By the about way, Heisman being... is a way better name than Real Wellness. I just thought I'd put it out there. Yeah, I'm thank you. Saying. Thank you. Yeah, it's, we, we've, we're evolving, right? We're, we're, <laughs> Real we're Wellness evolving. is like, really? Really? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> well, the the idea behind real wellness, and it's somewhat related to Heisman, is that is that for me a large part of my wellness has includes cannabis. But but the the typical thinking, at least at the point, it was that cannabis was not about wellness. Yeah. Right? Okay. So this okay. theme is gonna this theme is gonna keep going. All right. And and so with with Heisman, yeah, I did win the Heisman, but also right getting high has become like a negative thing. Well, yeah, I was yeah. reading some books, I re read some books so written in the, in the 60s and the 70s, and they talked about being stoned and being high as a positive thing, Yeah, you know? And so, I, and that, that relate, that, that resonated much more with, with me, you know, but really the conversation is when, when cannabis became um, useful to me is when I was dealing with mental health issues, okay? And so my definition of mental health, at least the, the basis of it, is when we say mental, we're, we're talking about what's going on inside, mm -hmm. okay? Inside. And the health, right, is, is it, is, it feels good, right? We feel good. And I wasn't feeling good. And a, a big part is because I wasn't paying attention to what was going on on the inside. Well, you, when you I started- split, You split your product into three groups of pregame, halftime, postgame. What is, what's going on there? So it's a it's a naming convention to to help people understand um, the effects of cannabis, you know, because, you, you know, you talked about uh, taking a hit and a big part of what I want to talk about is what people do after they take the hit. Mm -hmm. And so pregame is the idea of, of it's what in the, the common nomenclature people call sativa. It's more of a of a, it's more mental, more stimulating, more active. OK, uh, and then post game is what people are tend to. Well, tend how to about halftime? You got a half time is a hybrid and, and you know, really most of what we are consuming in the, in the States is technically a, a hybrid. hybrid? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a hybrid and it's, and it's kind of a mixed effect is a, is a way to, to simplify it. Right. And so the idea is giving people a, a way to think about the effects of cannabis. Again, what do they do after they take a hit? Totally a personal question, man. Um, how do I get into this? It's <laughs> such how, how can I get into the weed biz, man? I, I'm telling you right now, man, this is going to be huge. It's already huge, but people have no idea. You think the alcohol industry is big? I mean, alcohol is deleterious all the way down the line. All it is straight, down. all the way down the line. It is, it is a degradation, okay, on your body, on your psyche, everything. This actually has benefits. This is the future of people being recreationally relaxed. How, how do I get in, Ricky? How do I get in? Well, how would you like to get in? I don't know, man. <laughs> I, I'm serious when I say I don't know. But yeah, I would like to get in. What do you want to do? What do you? What would you like Wait, to do I, in this? Chuck, space? I thought your comedy career was going great. Man, you it ain't going. About it. Hey, let me tell you something. <laughs> it, my career ain't going as well as weed. <laughs> you can do. You can do weed comedy. Weed comedy <laughs> for real. Like that's the beautiful thing about the space is is it's a large industry. So whatever your skill set is. There's a there's a place for you. Yeah, a slot, a slot. You got to figure right out what on. that slot is. Okay. Right. All right. I'm gonna work on that. Well, yeah. I'm gonna work on that, and I'm gonna reach out to you, man. All right. So, but you, you have thoughts and and intellectual ambitions or dream states that include space. When you're getting high, is that correct? Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, I, I yeah, I was I was starting to to explain that yes, that when I when I smoke, I'm I'm thinking about planets and stars, constellations, the cosmos, etc. Yeah, really. You know, to me, I feel like I feel like it, this is an, an intuition that that life seems chaotic, but when we look up, there's some kind of order that can help us make sense of the chaos. Mm. Ah, Neil. What 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 you want from No, all I can say is I look up and think about the universe without weed. So if so Oh my god, I... so you, now you know what we gotta do now. <laughs> no, now you know you know what we gotta do now. We we gotta get Neil high. No. Eric <laughs> Eric, we gotta smoke some weed with Neil. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would love that. I would love, love, All love right. that. I think yes. you, there's going to be a big audience for that, by the way. <laughs> but, but let me just yeah. say, so, so Eric, there's, I mean, we have software now. I mean, the old days we'd have to find an ephemeris and look up tables and times and dates and longitude and latitude on Earth in order yeah. to know where things are and where they were going, where they were going to be when you were going to be at the telescope. And now yeah. it's just all in apps. 
basically. Yeah. And so yeah. the art of finding things in the night sky is gone, but now you can find many more things because you're not wasting your time digging up tables and trying to calculate things. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but you know, it's like using an abacus, Neil. It's like, you know, it's, yeah, you have a calculator and you don't need it and you have software, but you know, there's something about moving those little beads across that bar that does something to you mentally that an app never could. Yeah, you will never invent an airplane on an abacus. <laughs> there's, there's, some, there's some stuff that is forever out of your reach. <laughs> so Eric, tell me, because I'm, I'm an academic and I value people's ambitions, uh, uh, their curiosity as it takes them into whole, whole realms of thought and understanding. Is the universe just one of many branches of thought that stimulate you? I would say it's in a sense it's it's like the um, it's what I use to help understand everything else. Oh, so it's like a primary driver in your life. Yes, and and so my experience actually is is I'm building an app, and so the reason I was doing the calculations is because I was and I'm just for my own personal use. I was building an app for my own personal use. And so that's why I was going through the calculations of learning how to use a computer uh, in my phone to tell me where where the planets are on specific or where where they were on specific dates. Um, and it, the one thing that I took away from it that blew my mind was it was the first time I had to really think about time you know, mm. a, mm -hmm. as a construct, because as you're trying to find, you know, where something was at a certain time. Like different people had different definitions of how they were counting time. And you have to get clear on that first before you can answer the, the second question. Yeah, by the way, and time and space are interlinked. So something that people don't consider, but maybe they should or could, is when you launch something from Earth to land on Mars, you are launching a moving rocket and a payload off of a moving platform, Earth, because it's orbiting the sun, headed out into space to an empty point in space where Mars will be when you get there. And so the, the orbital Ooh. dynamics of this are deep. I mean, it really is, as they say, rocket science, right? Mm. And, and so, but it connects you to the universe like nothing else. And I'll take any excuse people give to look up and start thinking about the universe. Man, just... we're wasting this conversation. I'll be right back. I got to go get some weed. You know what? Check. <laughs> got the munchies. So, Eric. Well, um, I just have one question here. So, of course. so if, I'm, yeah. if, I'm getting this, if I'm getting this right, it took a tremendous amount of confidence for, for people to launch something to see if their, if their hypotheses of where the planets are going to be were, were accurate. Well, so I, confidence is not the right. Yes. The, uh, Correct, mm. but that's not the operative thought. The, the confidence was in the calculations, though. Yeah, it, well, exactly. Yeah. So, so the confidence is in the calculations. We have the laws of that's why they call laws of physics. They apply mm. here, there, yesterday, and tomorrow. And so now we calculate with those laws of physics. I get somebody to double check my calculations in case I forgot to carry the two. You know, mm -hmm. you want to do that? You can triple check it on a computer or vice versa. And once you've done that, it's going to go where you send it. Unless some third other phenomenon happened, you know, a gremlin comes in and grabs it, you know, short, the, uh, you know, minus the possibility that there's something about the universe you have yet to discover, it's going to go exactly where you expect it to go. That's how and why science works. That's so, why, but, it's why there's science at all. But how do you account for that, that variable of something that science hasn't found yet? Yeah, it just messes up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't like, we work. We messed up for less. Wait, wait. We, we had a Mars probe, all right, a Mars orbital surveyor or something, and it went to Mars. It just blew past Mars. It wow. didn't go into orbit. And we said, what happened? What happened? And we found out that the engineers were using English units and the physicists were using metric units. And when they calculated the thrust, they used two different units, and it was too much thrust. And we lost, uh, you know, what was it? A, uh, 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 you know, uh, I don't remember what that probe cost. Certainly in the millions. So that was embarrassing. So well, stuff can why happen. Is it the, why did the British even get if there are no gremlins? Is what I'm saying. Why are the British getting blamed? 
again. Because you all stuck. So gremlins is that a, is that that's a, like a term that you guys use? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> is that a, actually there's something called Maxwell's demons, which are these uh -huh. things that make things happen that we know they happen, but we don't have an understanding of why they happen. Oh, well. And so Maxwell, James Clark Maxwell in the late 19th century, uh, had this concept that it's called Maxwell's demons. And the electron moves there because there's a demon that makes it happen. He doesn't really think they're demons, but we don't otherwise have an explanation well, for it. Well, you need it. a it's, variable, right? You need a it's variable just, for Exactly, it's just yeah, nature right. doing it. Yeah. So he, yeah. it's, it, they're called Maxwell's demons. They're fun, you can look them up. They're kind uh, of fun to think about. I'm definitely looking at it. That's where I live. That's where I live. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but don't uh, rely yeah. on them to get stuff done. All right? You got to, mm. you know. Well, well you, can ha not, you can't rely on them, but you can use their assistance. <laughs> <laughs> that would be interesting. That would be interesting. <laughs> we see okay, walking bring... down the street and a whole Pied Piper of Maxwell's demons following him. Oh, man, that's, I that's love not... It. That's not that. something I want to see. So, Eric, let's come back to Heisman. You've got three products right now. Are you looking at building this empire? And if so, where would you see yourself taking it? How, how are He's you You've got to hire Chuck first, but yeah, go on. After yeah, that. of course, mm -hmm. that's a given. So, I mean, how are you com calculating combinations, um, str compound strengths, efficacy? Because you know what? All of us on this podcast are all slightly different. Yeah. So in yeah. education, yeah. Education what's the dose? Is a, yeah. What's how you dose this Education is a, education is huge, and so we're, we're starting with with three SKUs. We're starting with three products, but really the the purpose of starting with these three products is to start the conversation. Right. You know, and there there hasn't been enough open, honest conversations about cannabis, how people are using it, and what they're doing after they use it. And so part of this is creating a platform because, you know, in the future, right, cannabis use is, is to me, is the future, right? It's, I think it's going to replace uh, pharmace a lot of pharmaceuticals, and I think it's going to, to a certain extent, replace, replace alcohol. But part of, for me, part of using cannabis is you have to learn how to function when you're having this more awareness of your subjective or internal state. And especially for guys, we don't have a lot of practice. And so for me, it's really about accessing our a internal emotions, right? Yes, right. it's, it's about a building a community of woke potheads. That, that's what that's really what Heisman is. is that's really what Heisman is about. I love that. That's <laughs> yo, that are doing that are doing you, something that are just, doing something just, in the world. No, you, that you, I, that you, you, you got to make that your tagline, man. It's like Heisman building a community of woke potheads. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, man, you There's can't go. You can't go wrong with that. <laughs> There's the t-shirt, Chuck. <laughs> All right, we got to take a quick break. Eric, delighted to have you. Um, thanks for calling in on, on this show. When we come back, we're going to bring on Dr. Stacy Gruber, the pot doc. And this is not her first rodeo on Star Talk. when Star Talk Sports Edition returns. We're back, Star Talk Sports Edition. And we're taking a hit, we've called it. And we've just come off of two segments uh, with Eric Myron, former football great, Heisman Trophy winner, and now someone who's going into the business of marketing, selling and marketing marijuana and its derivatives to help people. And we can't have a show on that without going to our go-to person on this very subject, Dr. Stacy Gruber. Stacy, welcome back to Star Talk. Oh my gosh. And, and, and let me, I gotta get, I'm gonna, I have to read this because I'll never get it straight. Director of the Cognitive and Clinical Neuroimaging Core at McLean Hospital's Brain Imaging Center. Okay, that's not enough, apparently, Stacy. And Associate Professor of Psychiatry, Harvard Medical School. Also true. Ding, ding. That's also true. And you direct my Marijuana Investigations for Neuroscientific Discovery. I love it. And affectionately known as the Pot Doc. Um, you listened in on those first two segments with Eric. So what's your reaction to him as a person, to him as a user, to to his life's arc? You know, I think he's had an extraordinary um, experience here. And I think a lot of us forget what early days were like. So many people these days talk about cannabis and cannabis-based exploration as if it's always been this simple. So Gary, how old is he now? He'll be circa 45. Circa uh, 45. Young That's old enough. So, he, so, uh, so you're right. Uh, Stacy, he's from another era. 
So I think in, in, yeah, people tend to forget it was only in 1996 that we re-legalized cannabis for medical purposes in this country, in California. And in 2004, it was a very different day from the day we are living now, right? Mm -hmm. So it was a really, really different road. And I think that he's had some unbelievable experiences. Um, and I have no doubt that this has allowed him to sort of move along this trajectory where he's taking his own experiences and his own desire and moving them forward as a healer. You know, I've never, I can't believe we've never asked this, or maybe we have, and I just forgot. But there has got to be a great deal of data from countries where uh, cannabis is legal. And uh, yeah, uh, what, what is, what, what are the uh, stats on the usage, uh, addiction, uh, crime? Or is, is there anything that's notable? I, I think that in general, we don't pay enough attention to your point, um, to data that comes from other places and other spaces, if you will. We tend to have a fairly um, egocentric view of these things here. And the U.S. history with regard to cannabis, as he touched upon, is cannabis has a really storied past and not for great reasons. Um, it's one of the sort of um, darkest areas in, in, in history in terms of, of substance use, misuse, mislabeling perhaps, and now finally sort of a, a reconceptualization. I'm not sure that we have a great sense of how those data inform us. We're very busy saying, but that's, that's their experience, not necessarily ours, although there's a lot of, lots of lessons that could be learned. And I think in places where they have more liberal use, we certainly see different patterns. We don't see the same rates of certain types of crime. We don't see the same rates of things associated with substance misuse or, or quote, the old, uh, the old term just be dependence, right? So that's mm -hmm. important. It's sort of like alcohol. Think of countries where alcohol is introduced to individuals within the sort of family environment at young ages. We don't necessarily see the same rates of, of difficulty with alcohol when those folks uh, get to, quote, legal age. We just don't. So, so, what, so what about the, the stereotype that people who smoke weed often are demotivated? Yeah. And he, he's, he seems pretty motivated to do get done what he wants. But what, what of that? Stereotype. What can what can what can you tell us about this? I, th I think the a motivational syndrome data has largely been, um, I, I think, questioned at this point because I think a lot of things factor into these equations. It's not just the cannabis use. It's how much. It's how often. It's at what stage in your quote developmental process. What else is happening? And also, I love to remind people: what's in your weed? It's not all created equal. It's not one thing. And as he very appropriately alluded to. When he's talking about his pre-game, game, and post-game regimens and these chemo bars that he's really referring to, or strains, if you will, varieties of cannabis sativa L, the name of the plant, the reason he's pointing these out is because different chemo bars or cultivars have different constituents that give them different effects. I think, I don't remember if it was you, Chuck, probably, because Chuck's very astute in this particular area. Um, not everybody's created equally either. We all have different, you know, each of us on this podcast, or maybe it was Gary, we all process things differently, different metabolism, different genetic profile, different experience, and that's going to affect things too. But, you know, it's the constituents in cannabis. It's not just THC and CBD. It's those terpenes, terpenoids, the essential oils in cannabis that give it its characteristic scent and quote flavor profile are often related to things like couch lock. Oh man, I can't get up. I have to sit here and just chill. That's you know, very often related to some of the, the, the terpenes that are there, not just. So, but, and, but there are people who might react to it more along that path, like you're saying, than along another, because there's some highly productive pe people, among them Carl Sagan, who is sort of a famously uh, a famous pot user often and a lot, and no one ever accused him of not being productive. That is, so, you know, it was going to be my go-to example for you, given this particular round here at StarTalk. Mm. Uh, Carl Sagan, whose very close friend was Lester Grinspoon, who was one of the greatest cannabis researchers of all time from Harvard Medical School. Um, close friends. And Carl Sagan apparently used to say to Lester, you just don't understand it. And Lester made it his mission because of his friendship to understand it better. It actually became a saving grace for his own son, who was battling cancer and who was having terrible difficulty eating after these treatments and changed his life, ultimately changed his whole trajectory. But that's right. Nobody would accuse Carl Sagan. Of not getting a lot of stuff to them, right? So wow, well, I, I had no idea that Carl Sagan smoked weed. I, I, this is the first I'm ever hearing of it. 
But now it might explain, maybe he wasn't seeing billions of stars. He was only seeing millions. And <laughs> <laughs> then he exaggerated it. Up. Well, no, it's... <laughs> Plus, I think at the time or, or recently, uh, his widow, Andrean served on the board of the of Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, right? Oh, wow. So, so I think they, the two of them together, as a creative pair, because they published several books together, co-wrote the first Cosmos together. Um, so I think whatever, whatever example one puts forth of either demotivation or what any other negative effects, they have to be counterbalanced with the examples that are the exact opposite. And therefore you have to ask, where do you land on, I'm just repeating what you're saying, Stacy. We have to ask, well, how does it affect you? And maybe you need a different combination of those derivative chemicals or none or all, or all of them, right? Right, right. Certainly no shortage of examples of people who get a whole lot of things done and who are wildly successful who embrace the use of cannabis or cannabinoids, no question. So, Stacey, with Eric's range in Heisman, there's the, like I say, pregame, alertness, motivation, halftime, anti-inflammatory and calming, postgame, pain relief, relaxation and sleep. With your knowledge, research, et cetera, where else is Eric likely to go in terms of developing products using the cannabinoid and the, the elements and compounds within? I say, let's not uh, go there on the air publicly. Let's save that information <laughs> for a private <laughs> conversation. <laughs> That's right. I think he was, he was pretty clear, I think, on the educational aspects of this, right? Like allowing the conversations to start and continue to figure out not only the best combinations of what I think he was alluding to, which are the individual constituents and compounds mm -hmm. to address specific ailments or, or conditions that people have, but also to get people talking about it to help ultimately destigmatize. You know, there are differences in people who are using for different reasons. And the stigma that goes sort of across the board to everyone is rather inappropriate at this point when people acknowledge, I'm, I'm not looking to just, you know, get high and looking to address these symptoms, which may or may not be his, his shtick either. Um, that's very different. And so I appreciated that part, but in terms of other areas, you know, I, I'm not sure what else he, he's not covered. I didn't, I didn't get an exhaustive list, but I think for sure, something that's important to him, given his own experiences is mental health. And we're certainly seeing an explosion of work in this area, our errors and, and so many others, which is long time coming. Just to remind people, you are associate professor of psychiatry. <laughs> at, at Harvard Medical School. So when you speak of mental health, you yeah. speak of that as a professional uh, in, in the field. First and foremost, we are psychiatry 100% of the time. We do lots of other things. But one of the things that we're very invested in is understanding the ways in which the, the real world experience of individuals, whether they're patients or have some concern, where there's concern, where there's less concern, and how we might be able to allow people to use what we know to inform their best practices. It, you know, just saying no doesn't usually work. So now we wanna say, you know, something a little bit more uh, educated that guides people. Um, there's a lot to learn in this particular space. So Neil, in, this, in 2022, we've got the NFL spending a million dollars, right? As a grant for studies into the efficacy of marijuana and its component parts for pain management and concussion treatments, which goes back to our good friend, Leonard Marshall. Also, you've got WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency, conducting again scientific review this year in 22 to see if it still makes sense to continue its international ban on marijuana. So I'll ask Dr. Dr. Gruber, what do you think they're going to find and how do you think they're going to bring those results and thinking forward? In terms of what WADA will do? Or, and or with uh, the NFL. So I think the, the NFL initiative is an incredibly important one. And there's been lots of interest in this particular space. And the folks who are doing the work at UCSD are fantastic. And, uh, there's a lot to sort of- University of California, San Diego. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and is, is a million dollars a lot of money? In this yeah, space? I was going to say, that's kind well, of cheap for the NFL. Yeah, you know. given that, you know, some players make a million dollars before halftime. Right. Yeah, I, I, I think um, I think there's, let me put it this way, I think there's so much work to be done, there would never be uh, something that would be too much, let me put it that way. There's a lot to do. And I think it's a very important area to begin in, given what we know about individuals who sustain head trauma 
or traumatic brain injury and how that looks over time and what we might be able to do either with regard to prevention or treatment. I think it's incredibly important. I think WADA is, is likely to take, I would hope, a very holistic view at this point. There's been an awful lot that's happened and WADA has changed, as you pointed out, I think previously, they've changed their sort of um, um, approach a couple of times. So let's see what happens. But I'm hoping that they'll use a fair amount of data. Remember, there are substances with similar therapeutic, effect, ther similar therapeutic effects to cannabis and cannabinoids, sedatives, anxiolytics, that are not banned by water. Mm. Think of it. Aspirin's not banned. Ibuprofen's not banned. Right. Um, and so right. when we think about that, you know, that's important to keep in mind. For people who are using specifically for those reasons, especially as Chuck alluded to earlier, Stuff that's not necessarily um, comprised of a lot of THC, where you're really looking at the non-intoxicating cannabinoids to get at some of the inflammation-related issues or pain or, or sleep, whatever, you have to consider this slightly differently, I think. And I just checked a Tom Brady's salary. He makes a million dollars <laughs> by half, half time. Wow. Yeah. So you've answered your own questions. He's so, like, Neil, all, all, all you've done is aggravate Chuck even more. Yeah, was, that's, <laughs> that's the truth. And no, nothing could be truer. Chuck the Eagles fan. Okay. What a so, waste of a million dollars. <laughs> so, Dr. Gruber, you, you introduced, I'm going to try and steer this back onto the road. Um, <laughs> you introduced us to the endocannabinoid system in the body. That's too and many syllables for me. All right. Um, and as Chuck so, as, as Chuck so distinctly, yes, right, distinctly captioned it as we're designed to get high last time that we had you as a guest. Where are we now? Because this doesn't sound like ancient research into this system. This sounds like something that's been happening recently. So where are we and how far along? In terms of what we know about the endocannabinoid system? Mm -hmm. So um, I, th I think we've, we've, begun to make a, a lot of progress. It, there's a lot of work in this area. And while we may be wired for weed, um, that's not likely the reason we have um, cannabinoid receptors. We make our own, hence the term endocannabinoid. We make our own chemicals that bind to our own receptors. Endo as an endocrine system. As endo, yes. right, or as a, yeah, it's endogenous. So we have an endogenous system of chemicals and receptors throughout the brain and body, the sure. endocannabinoid system. Every mammal has it. I think there's an awful lot that we've learned. There's more still to go. But in terms of how individual cannabinoids interact with the endocannabinoid system, that's the interesting thing. When we think of the plant, there are over 120 phytocannabinoids, things from the plant that directly interact with our own endocannabinoid system. The ways in which those things happen is, is still being determined. We've just really made a lot of progress in a couple of more of the major constituents. And there's a lot of room to, to grow here. So we have the receptors, not for smoking weed, although it serves that purpose. We, we feed those, our own receptors. So, right. So think of it as in terms of opioid receptors. Do we have opioid receptors because we're supposed to be using heroin? No, we have opioid receptors because, because of the ways in which our, our neurotransmitters, our brains and bodies function. So in the case of cannabis or cannabinoids, really quickly, we have anandamide and 2-AG, these two chemicals and we have these receptors to which these things bind, and we have things that break them down, break down these chemicals. So that's our own system. It well, just so happens. So heroin that, hijacks our own system. Heroin in terms of, of opioid receptors, mu and kappa opioid receptors, different, different systems. But yeah, again, it sort of exploits the fact we have these receptors. It's just not necessarily designed for that. They just right. happen to be effective. It's, 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 it's making use of the receptors, but it's not necessarily what they were designed for specifically. Right, because I think there are people who want to believe they were designed for that, and so therefore right. everyone should like- And I wasn't there. Born. At the design table, I wasn't there. Had you been, you would have been given advice on a much better design. Something, something I want to ask Dr. Then Google, I'll pause the tense, by the way. That was a famous- <laughs> All right. Part. We didn't get uh, had an Had I been answer. present at the time of creation, I would have given the good Lord advice on how to do it better. So. I attributed a quote to Eric that he said wasn't him, but it was something that indigenous tribes people thousands of years ago believed that you needed an altered state to heal. How would you react to that, Doctor, as terms of what their thinking was and, you know, are they somewhere they shouldn't be or are they on the right line? Or, or and I, I can invert that, and we got to kind of end on this question, but I can invert that and say, what happens 
if you heal in a non-altered state? What, 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 what is the benefit if there is one at all? Or is it just, you would just want to have it like, like giving birth, you're in a whole other mental state and you forget that you were ever in the pain you were, as I'm told. And so there's some physiology that, that, okay. that promotes that fact. So, you know, and I think it's a really interesting question. And it's one that I, I think probably depends on what we're talking about when we're talking about healing from what? Mental mm. versus physical. Yeah. I mean, we're all connected, right? And so it, it goes without saying that perhaps in some of these, these times, um, it is very possible that in order to, quote, heal, you have to allow yourself the space, if you will. So that may be altered from your everyday. You got to give yourself time and space. Can you heal without being altered? Um, I, sure. Sure. Uh, I think the, the, you know, sort of the rigid answer is yes, of course. What do they mean by that? I like to think that maybe they mean sometimes you have to have a little bit of a shift in set to allow yourself to heal most thoroughly and comprehensively. Does that mean stoned? Not necessarily. Uh, so, but, you know. but it could also mean that once you come out of that mental state, you don't have easy memory back into it so that you, you, your, your, your life is not burdened by the memories of pain because they happened in a different mental state. You were in a different room at the time. Yeah. Or it could be that they were just getting high and then they found some benefits after they came down. You know, which okay. it's like, yeah, yeah, man, I can't believe it. Every time I get high and, you know, my knees used to hurt, now they don't. But you, mm -hmm. you know, people mm -hmm. will say this a lot. They'll say, I had to be altered to experience X, Y, Z, one, two, three. And now I have a complete shift in my consciousness and my everyday life that wouldn't have happened without that. That is very common. When we think about things like hallucinogens, ayahuasca, and, and yeah. these, these people, I'm, please, again, judgment free zone. It's all good. Yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, that's very possible. And I, I uh, yeah, when you talk about ayahuasca, it's like, it's so the, the research is going into it now, one of which is they're finding that it is, um, it's effective at helping cure, cure addiction. There are people who use it and they come off of heroin and they don't ever go back. Maybe that's the altered state that you have to be in mm. to promote healing. Yeah, yeah, there it goes. Well, guys, we got to land the plane right there on that runway. Uh, Stacy, it has been a delight to have you. Uh, you bring focus and perspective and expert, more impo most importantly, academic expertise to what we do, and that is centered to the DNA of Star Talk and, of course, Star Talk Sports Edition. Gary, always good to have you, man. Chuck, Pleasure, my friend. Thank you. Both you guys. And I, this Pleasure. has been Star Talk Sports Edition. And the right hit, what do we call this, Gary? The taking, taking a, hit. a hit. Taking a hit. Taking a hit. Yeah. <laughs> this seemed to be the only thing you could possibly call it. That has football players and smoking marijuana in the same show. All right. Mm -hmm. We've got it. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. Keep looking up. <laughs>